haven't had a chance to glance through it yet, is a first draft uh, of, a, of a final report that I was uh, uh, asked to prepare. And uh, uh, the general task was to describe, you know, what's the intersection uh, between uh, water policy generally, but particularly uh, groundwater issues and international trade and investment law. Page 19, um, that uh, the challenge under international investment agreement and bilateral investment treaties Maine's authority to regulate water resources is always possible, particularly where the state of Maine has not asserted ownership of water resources or a claim of holding for those resources. Really vulnerable is this when you have a change of policy. Mm -hmm. If an investor comes in, presumably they've done their due diligence and they realize what the regulatory situation is, and they make their in investment based on that. And that if you ha if you have uh, invested the owners of surface land, as I've heard Linda Pisser describe it, with the substantial rights of access to the water underneath, and if you were, and if you thought that it was a good idea, you know, to make you know to somewhat restrict those. Right then you have a change in, in, in the regulatory authority that, that might that you might be able to argue that you know your the value of your investment has been been reduced and, and there is a whole line of international investment agreement decisions that say that when there's that kind of uh, of change in policy when when, there, when, the, when you don't have what they call a stable legal environment mm -hmm. that, that you're, you're subject uh, uh, subject to challenge. Okay. So the current situation in Maine is absolute dominion ownership of groundwater. And for the legislature to go, we're trying to work this out a little bit, if the legislature decided they wanted to uh, transfer that ownership from, uh, or the, change the policy from absolute dominion to um, something other in, into a public trust, we heard a lot of testimony at the public hearing on, you know, we need to get this water into a public trust. Um, from what you just said, I, I would, I, you know, my thought process is that that could be, that could stick up a red flag um, that change in regulatory scheme. Yeah, if I already had an investment. Right. On the other hand, take, take the mm -hmm. other point of view, if I'm worried about that kind of a challenge, maybe I want to put it in tr public trust now, rather than make that change 30 years from now, when there are a lot more foreign investors here uh, can, who are looking for Maine's water. Can, can you sling that water in public trust would protect it? Well, I, it, I, I think you, it has, you know, the, 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 in other words, if your ability to draw water out is reduced uh, as a practical matter. This is all fact-based, you know, it's not abstract. If the fact situation is such that you're not, you're not able to pump as much water, you're not able to do the things you wanted to do with your investment as a result of that kind of a change, then, then, then you, can, you can make a claim. But as far as an advantage, how does, this, how does this state in a better position with groundwater in the public trust than they are currently? Uh, I, I, I'm not arguing that one way or the other. I'm just saying that it would have an effect on likelihood of, of litigation because one of the primary causes of international investment litigation is when the rules of the game change. Okay. You know, when, 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 you, when you have a change in government, <clears throat> change in tax schemes, change in regulatory policy, and, and the question is whether or not international law uh, pr uh, really prohibits, uh, especially when there's a contract, mm -hmm. uh, prohibits a government from changing their tax or regulatory policy without providing compensation. Certainly, uh, under U.S. law and, 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 and most systems of property right protection in the world, a change in government policy you know, is not something you get compensated for. Probably your concerns with, are, aren't unique to, to water. Right. They capture other resources in that Right. Action. But there's yeah. no reason why you couldn't have a bulk water case. I, I just think that probably that bulk water transfer thing is seen as something that would be common 25 years from now is not that common right now. And you, you seem comfortable that the, uh, the federal government uh, won't include drinking water or they don't want to include drinking water in, in trade agreements? No, I think of the, the Antigua case where it wasn't their intention to include uh, gambling. Discussion of bulk water, mm -hmm. and I understand, you know, your summary that there's disagreement among mm. all the experts as to whether that's considered a good or not. I'd like to understand a little bit more about when the natural waters are considered bulk water. Where do we draw the boundary? That's the question. And there's been no decision. I mean, if you, if you, if you put it in a gallon jug, I guess it's like 
I guess it's like bottled water. Mm -hmm. What if it's what if it's a six foot tank? Is that well, like I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually not talking about the size of the vessel. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about the process of taking it out, out of the ground and putting it into something of any size, a truck, a pipeline. Where do we draw the boundary between what we call water in its natural state and bulk water? Well, that's the argument that's made by the skeptics of the traditional view. They say there is no logical distinction mm -hmm. between bottled water yeah. And, 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 and water that is being transported in, in, a, in a ship, that it's both a container, it is being introduced in commerce. As a matter of fact, it's a modern commercial reality that you're selling water. Yeah. Our regulations focus on the process mm -hmm. of withdrawing water for whatever purpose mm -hmm. and what the impacts of that withdrawal would be on other uses, other you know mm -hmm. ecological needs, wetlands, stream flow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We don't focus that much on what happens once you pump it out in, in accordance with whatever permit you have. Mm -hmm. um, we don't focus specifically, except in limited cases, on what happens once it goes into a truck or into a bottle. So that's what I'm right. trying to get at is, is we have water in its natural state in the ground. Mm -hmm. We go through a process which is permitted mm -hmm. to allow that water to be used for any number of purposes. Um, and so what I'm trying to understand, and one of those purposes, it might be to put it in large trucks for transport. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where does this, do these agreements on goods uh, cease in, or begin in that process from water in its natural state in the ground going through a pumping process and then into a vessel? I think the answer is we don't know. We have two different theories. And if, and if your environmental and other public purposes are very clear, yeah. then it may come under an exception, like the Title 20 exception under the GATT, because it's really a three-part analysis. The first question is, does the agreement cover it? The second question, have you violated an obligation? Now, there, the, one of the, the export res uh, restrictions are generally, with some exceptions, prohibited by the GATT. That's a big problem because they, people could see your environmental and, and, and natural resource regulation as a disguised attempt to right. inhibit right. a foreign company right. from exporting right. something that they've invested in. But then the, the final stage of the analysis is you look, it has, has it been uh, carved out or are there exceptions? And, and, and unlike the investment agreements, the, the, the GATT does provide an exception for um, uh, The best position is to have those regulations, as, you, as you've described, that are, um, have, a, have a sound basis, are reasonable, are applied in a non-discriminatory uh, fashion, have due process, et cetera, right. uh, as, as a key element in uh, defending against a lot of these types of challenges. Absolutely. And the outrages me about the metal cloud decision and the MTD decision uh, in effect, uh, you know, the, the effusive uh, and, and, and political assurances of people, uh, you know, who, uh, who are trying to encourage investment were, were treated as if uh, it was language from a carefully negotiated contract. I, I, I really had a lot of problems with that, with the whole idea that a politician's promise could be a, a property right. I don't think that that's likely to happen against the United States. I think it, uh, that kind of aggressive interpretation of minimum standard of treatment is more likely to be applied against a, a developing country or a middle-income country like, like Mexico and, and, and Chile. Uh, the tribunals are extremely reluctant as a matter of political behavior uh, to find the United States in violation um, because the United States is the biggest person on the block, they have a lot of power. What's changing is we have pending, and this uh, goes back to your question previously, Sharon, is that right now the next planned investment negotiations are with China and India. It's a, a China-U.S. investor dispute, or an India-U.S. investor dispute. I mean, China's sitting on something like a trillion dollars in, in, in U.S. securities, and, and they have sovereign wealth funds and so forth. They may want to buy up a lot of our industry and so forth, and maybe we need their investments to get our economy going again. 
but, but we sure as heck don't want any investment disputes that might come out of that uh, resolved by, uh, you know, by three men in Geneva. I'm absolutely convinced that these investors uh, treat different parties in different ways. I think they're much more inclined to come down hard on Ecuador than they are in the United States. China and the United States, I think you have a different equation. Is that some people suggested that, that is that water should be um, excluded from all trade agreements. Is that an effective policy strategy? Well, if you're worried about uh, getting sued, WTO or after Chapter 11, that's that's a good way to approach it. Now there may be other countervailing concerns. There would be discriminatory issues with that. No, no, you, you would, we would, everyone would agree to, to exclude it.